I think it's up to me to say hello and welcome to everybody. Thanks for, for making it after, uh, of course, a first or several highlights that we had today in the uh, Deutsche Forum Sicherheitspolitik. Uh, thank you also for the Bucks to hosting all this and bringing all this together. Um, we are glad that you have switched into this channel, which is about the security threat on NATO's eastern flank, challenges and continuity in perception and policy, which is bringing us back, of course, a little bit of um, security and especially defense policy and the different perspectives that one can have on that. Um, and what is, of course, most important to that is, on the one hand, having a voice from the region, which is the defense minister of Latvia, who is with us, Mr. Pavix, um, having a voice from the other side of the Atlantic, because your European security is so much dependent, especially on the defense side, on the US. So it's great to hear a little bit about what we can expect from the new Biden administration with regard not to European security as such, but just, uh, I guess also with the focus on the eastern and on the northeastern flank. And of course, one of the biggest and most important partners to all Europeans is Germany. And therefore, I'm very happy to, to have Secretary of State Mr. Silberhorn with us to also give the kind of the, the German view on what is going to happen here. I'll try to be very brief. We asked every panelist to limit him and herself to about seven minutes so that we have enough time for question and answers. You can write your answers either into the chat uh, or you can try afterwards after the uh, initial comments by our three speakers, you can raise your hand and I'll try to fish somebody out um, and give you the opportunity to pose your question live. Um, I will in any case try and cluster the questions because it's quite a limited amount of time that we have. Uh, overall, we have an hour and I guess we'll arrive with maximum 40 minutes that we have for Q&A. Uh, and therefore, I would like to give the floor immediately to the first speaker that is Mr. Pabriks, the Minister of Defense from Latvia. Please, the floor is yours. Hello and good evening, everybody. Um, I will try to put maybe a few dots on uh, the issues which are on our minds all the time. And um, I hope that this will trigger uh, some kind of a more vivid discussion on the security issues, not only on so-called Eastern flank or the region I'm representing, which is Northern Europe, Baltic Sea, uh, Baltic countries, but on Europe and world as such. Now, where do we stand? We stand in a situation where um, global value system, global technologies and global powers are shifting in a very high speed. And that means that all previous structures or many from previous security structures are not anymore very much corresponding to those challenges that we have. If I'm looking from the perspective of Europe, and here we represent the European northern part, then of course one of our biggest challenges is our neighboring country Russia. You could see that Russian activities have been uh, unchecked, Russian activities have been turbulent, uh, they have been revanchistic, uh, trying to grasp as much as power as possible, or as Lord Palmerston told, if I remember correctly, 1859, that whenever you give something or you show the weakness, uh, Russia at that time would be ready to grasp it. Here, of course, are thinking about other uh, regions in those days. Uh, actually, it was probably questions of Caucasian region and Crimea and also Central Asia. But nothing much changes uh, when ta time passes because because the mentality of political thinking has a very, um, how to say, continuous application also in our days. So Russia is a challenge. Uh, at the same time, we can see also that uh, now another very, very big country in the world, Ch China is increasing challenge for the Western situation, for the Western countries, for the Western alliances, and for all its neighbors as well. Now, uh, looking from our perspective here in Europe, uh, it's, of course, a very nice thing to ask uh, what the United States will do under the new administration, what Biden will do, uh, how he will combine all the American powers in the Pacific and its representation in European continent and somewhere else. 
Uh, these are valid questions because United States is still a superpower. United States is the strongest country and largest contributor to our common security alliance to NATO. Uh, but at the same time, I think we are really missing question what we Europeans can do more and better and different because obviously different types of challenges what we are facing now require also a different type of answers. And uh, if I'm looking to European continent as such, we see that there is a quite large vacuum of power. There is a weakness of Europe, which also um, makes Western much, much weaker because without Americans, we can't do much. And we know that there is a different um, types of approaches, uh, including our French partners and et cetera, about European autonomy. And I'm not speaking about this. I'm speaking about possibility to create a system of cooperation in Europe and to change the mindset of our citizens. And here I speak more about citizens in the Western Europe than in my country, because uh, we as a border country, we understand security threat totally different. Because for us, it is a fundamental threat. It is existential threat, including Russian threat. But for the West, it still um, seems to me that a large part of our voters are either living in a past uh, where uh, kind of war or such challenges were not existent or somebody was taking care of them, either Americans or somebody else, or they are living already in a post-post-modern future where we can speak about uh, different uh, modern type of values, starting with uh, veganism, I don't want to offend anybody, and ending with uh, pacifism. But we must understand that those countries which are challenging us, they think in totally different terms. And uh, our terminology is not a security answer to terminology of such countries as Russia and China. Now, what can we do? Uh, there's always a question. First, I think we have to change the mindset of Western, uh, Western people, uh, Western citizens, in order for them to understand that if they will be not capable to defend uh, or ready to defend also by military means, themselves, their neighbor, neighbors, and also the fragility of their liberty, then they will be simply crushed. We will be fragmented and we will lose. And uh, another thing, practical thing, what I would offer a part of, um, a part of value system is for, for instance, a different type of cooperation between countries. And I will take here a German as an example because we are uh, in a German panel. I have very good cooperation on military industry um, part, for instance, in such countries as Finland. I know that uh, in our region, for instance, Germany would be a very great partner to us with industrial goods, with military goods, et cetera. But Germany is missing kind of a flexibility to adjust to these things. For instance, we need here to proceed not only a bidding possibilities for different companies, Italy, France, America, or Germany, but we need the state contracts. So if there would be a chance, and here maybe uh, Mr. Zilberman can later on assist us with answering how does it look from the um, pure administrative situation, we need a chance to conclude a state-to-state -state contract, which gives us more time, which gives us more quality and better guarantees. And we would prefer a state-to-state -state contracts from time to time, instead of simply bidding for some companies. So this is another suggestion if you want to think about kind of very low level practical cooperation to increase our security. But I will finish with this because I believe uh, we can comment and discuss uh, on a number of other things that one of my biggest challenges is a, is a mindset because if people go into the ring to fight, if people go to the war, if people don't want to go to the war, it's not just a question uh, a question about weaponry. It's not a question about economic might or power. It's not even a question about Nord Stream 2. It is a question about your resilience, your readiness to risk. And as one of my friends, Andrew, Andrew Michter, lately wrote, we are becoming a country of, um, uh, of in English it would be of, um, uh, one moment, just this word of um, um, zero risk. So we don't want to risk with anything. And if you are not ready to risk, you are actually very close to lose most of it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And that was perfectly in time also. Thanks for, very much. Um, from 
this side and the very important question of what the Europeans are going to do and over to the other side, what are the Americans going to do and what do they expect? Is there a question that has been posed to us that we should answer or where is the US standing after 100 days of Biden? Rachel. Rachel is joining us from the CSIS, one of the biggest and most important think tanks in Washington. Great to have you, Rachel. Thanks for making it, for making the time. Absolutely. Great to be here and to talk about this topic. Very timely with the first 100 days. I think when we're in this time warp of, of the pandemic, it's, it's sometimes hard to remember that we've had our new president for barely three months and yeah. he's had a lot on his plate in these early days. But I do think there are some, some things we can see um, even in these first hundred days. I mean, Europe has certainly been uh, a big destination for travel for our Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, and, and soon to be the president as well. And there've been a number of, of engagements and attempts to align our policies. So I think even in the early days, when we think about the Biden administration's approach to the region and how it differs from, from the previous administration, we see a more constructive tone, uh, we see a message to the European Union and, and European countries that there are natural partners. And we see really deliberate efforts at alignment, whether that's on sanctions um, or, or legislation uh, in terms of technology and security. There's a really robust agenda. In areas, in some areas, though, I do think you, you sent a bit of continuity even from the previous administration. And it's worth reminding ourselves of those um, at the outset. So I think the first is this continued expectation of responsibility sharing. And I say responsibility deliberately rather than burden sharing, because I do think it's our collective responsibility to our own security and our collective security. I think we also see continuity in the US position on China. Uh, our Congress doesn't agree on much, but there's bipartisan support on the Hill for making sure that U.S. technology, security and trade practices, and indeed this idea of a rules-based international order are safeguarded together with our European allies and partners. The third thing that where there is some continuity with the previous administration is on the focus on, on domestic economics and domestic industry in particular. I don't necessarily see this as a negative for the transatlantic relationship, but I do think it requires some diligence to make sure that when we talk about defense industrial cooperation or supply chains, that we have in mind that those will be stronger if they're if we take a transatlantic approach and consider, consider allies and partners as part of an, an inner circle within that framework. Um, if I turn a little bit to the Eastern flank and what the implications are, particularly, um, you know, not just for Europe, but the Eastern, Eastern flank in general, uh, you know, you, you do still see this US commitment to NATO. You see support for Europe and EU defense. In fact, when Secretary Austin was there a few months ago, in Germany, he announced a, a troop increase in Germany. He not on, only halted the anticipated decline in US forces in Germany announced under the previous administration, he put some pretty important capabilities uh, in Germany. And these are the types of things that, that I'll talk about a little bit later, because I think they are shaping the way that the US thinks about its military presence and its role in defending the Eastern flank. But at the same time, I think that that sort of enthusiasm um, for cont continuity in US policy towards the Eastern flank, Europe and NATO has to be tempered with the reality that the US and the Biden administration is very much focused on the pandemic, on our domestic economy, and certainly in military terms, China as a pacing threat. Uh, I don't know how closely you're all watching the defense budget uh, and, and the overall budget for this year, but certainly the defense budget uh, is under pressure. Domestic agencies uh, and competencies are, are certainly the winners uh, with defense and, and even State Department to some extent seeing less than, than they had anticipated. So I think that's something that, that sort of gets to your question of what do we expect from the Europeans. Uh, I think I'll highlight just four broad things that, that the current administration expects from Europeans. The first is best captured by NATO. NATO has Article 3, which is, you know, take care of your own national defense. And I think our neighbors along the eastern flank, and particularly in that Nordic Baltic corner, whether you're an ally or a partner, have really shown the way, uh, not just in quantitative terms and meeting 2%, 20%, but in qualitative terms and really trying to modernize your armed forces, even as, as you try to rebuild readiness uh, after many years of focusing on crisis management rather than collective defense. 
So we're all kind of playing catch up, nobody more so than Germany, but I think Germany and others have a plan and if they're able to stick to it, that is something that the US uh, would have first and, and, and foremost in terms of their expectations. In this bucket, I think what you could do is, is look to the US to facilitate your ability to defend yourselves. Some examples of this would be coming to us if you're having difficulties with export controls and pointing out where those, those barriers are so that we can change our system or at least attempt to change our system to get at that. Uh, we've seen with the Baltic uh, nations attempts to pool FMS for these big ticket items like integrated air and missile defense that are too big for any single nation. Uh, we've tried to find you know, pooled funding as a way to get those off the ground. Uh, and then if there are certain high-end capabilities that you need the U.S. to forward station, articulate that. We're having those conversations through the NATO defense planning process, but those are all things that get at that first goal of taking care of your own defense. Secondly, um, and I think this is a tension right now, is providing for the defense of Europe and its immediate neighborhood. It's almost like Europe being involved in the Indo-Pacific is, is the flavor of the day, but I think we need to first and foremost make sure that Europe can take care of the full spectrum of conflict on the European continent and its immediate neighborhood. Uh, I do think from a US perspective, that really is uh, the main expectation. And here, I think it's really important to rely on nations. The minister alluded to this like Germany. Germany has called itself a framework nation. With the enhanced forward presence in the Baltics, it's shown that it's able to provide that core and have smaller countries pin on. I'd like to see more of that, particularly in the capability development area with things like P-8, maritime patrol aircraft, or again, integrated air and missile defense, things that smaller nations simply just don't have the mass and the capital to get off the ground. The third expectation would be a partner in safeguarding this international rules-based order. And this is everything from disinformation and malign influence uh, to managing those te technological, economic, and security concerns we see being presented by China. And I recognize that for most European nations, this is something that will happen through an EU lens and EU channels, but there's also national legislation that can be aligned towards this end. And then the fourth expectation would be, be a partner in managing transnational challenges like climate nonproliferation, the pandemic. And, and here we're seeing this slowly migrate into NATO, but I'm not necessarily convinced that NATO is always the right answer for dealing with things that might warrant an economic or diplomatic response rather than military. So sort of that final ask would be for those of you who are both EU members and NATO members, let's try to right size who should be focusing on what relative to the other. I think there's a place for NATO and climate change. Do I think they're the leading nation or the supporting nation or supporting organization? Probably more the latter. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and then just to sort of round out my time specific to the Baltics Russia regional threat, there, there are these differing threat perceptions across Europe and varying responses. So what are some of the things we can do to kind of check against uh, those realities. I think the first one is more deliberately using regional mechanisms. And particularly in the Nordic Baltic region, I always talk about this nesting doll approach. I mean, you're fortunate enough that you have things like the Northern Group, you have things like Nordefco. We need to use those better to recognize that there may be a gap in decision-making in a NATO context, there may be a time lag in the ability to get reinforcements to the region. So the more that we can integrate the planning at that regional level to supplement what's going on at that higher multinational level, I think that reinforces security on the Eastern flank. Um, the second one, and I'm almost done here, is coherence in our deterrence posture. Everybody knew I was gonna say that because NATO has been talking about it for the last five years. Uh, we have Defender 2021 now being exercised in NATO's southern flank. So this is a great time to sort of stress test uh, the ability to, to really have that coherent posture on, on the entire eastern flank. And then I suppose my last suggestion specific to this region is better implementation of a multi-domain approach to operations. When you look at the specific capabilities that Secretary Austin announced during his visit to Germany, 
you know, they were, you know, it was a multi-domain task force that was able to integrate information operations, cyber and space elements into the force. And it was a fires command. And I think if you look at those, it tells you a little bit about the way the U.S. is probably going to posture itself for the defense of, and deterrence of Europe in the future. There will still be some residual presence across all three services, but increasingly that will be, we'll seek to integrate that across domains and then maybe supplement it with uh, some periodic deployments through the dynamic force employment model. So I think within that framework, you start to understand the direction that NATO might go in with a greater regional focus and a greater focus on all the different tools across the domain of military conflict. So not just military, but looking to you all, particularly in this northeastern corner, to teach us your lessons learned in implementing this total defense approach across government. I think there's a lot there. I always talk about Northeastern Europe as, as a microcosm for what's going on in the Alliance, because you have a lot of really strong best practices to share. Thanks so much, Rachel. That was a great input from the, from the other side, but also kind of a, a friend on our side. Um, Secretary Silberhorn, how to sleep? Ministry of Defense in Berlin think about this. Is it is it a good time for us for the moment? Is it kind of a relief uh, that the US is back? And uh, what are we, what are the plans for now that uh, some of the, the biggest hurdles for more transatlantic cooperation are out of the way? Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Merling. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's always a good time for security policy. But times become uh, more challenging uh, in the forefront of parliamentary elections. So we have to ensure ourselves about uh, the, the most important pillars of our security and foreign policy. The perception differs, not in the security community, but among our citizens. And I just want to remember the strategic concept of 2010 of NATO. Uh, where NATO, I quote, uh, wanted a true strategic <clears throat> partnership between NATO and Russia. This is long ago. NATO, NATO's perception of Russia changed substantially after the annexation of uh, Crimea in 2014. And as we all know today, uh, the reality is different. Russia continues to demonstrate a pattern of uh, destabilizing behavior interference in allied elections, unauthorized intrusion of NATO's airspace, widespread disinformation campaigns and malicious cyber activities. Uh, the German Bundestag suffered several times already from concrete cyber attacks. And you know the attack on Alexei Navalny with the use of a nerve agent from the band Novichok Group. This is a clear breach of international law and demonstrates uh, there is no respect in Russia for the, for the physical integrity of its own citizens. And uh, the threat and fear and risk is that there is uh, no, uh, no, no, no respect of Russia from Russia towards uh, the territorial integrity of its neighboring countries. Uh, the Russian concept is to dominate, to uh, uh, influence on uh, their neighboring countries. There is no partnership and dialogue at eye level, and this is a completely different concept of foreign and security policy. So there is a strategic rivalry indeed between liberal Democrats and autocrats around the question whether individual freedom is respected, is a limitation of executive power, or the other way around, whether executive power overrules individual freedom and uh, human rights. For all these reasons, NATO has adjusted its posture on the Eastern flank. And I want to emphasize, emphasize this with continued adherence to the agreements reached in the NATO-Russia Founding Act and the Rome Declaration. The most important ally in protecting our eastern flank is still the United States, and it will remain so for the foreseeable future. Without America's conventional and nuclear capabilities, we cannot protect our 
ourselves. However, we have to do more and we will be called upon to do more as Europeans. And therefore, we have to strengthen NATO's European pillar in the course of the ongoing NATO 2030 adjustment process and in our understanding and full complementarity with NATO. A visible and tangible European commitment to strengthening the alliance should be our common objective. And of course, we have to ensure that uh, uh, all these processes in NATO and European Union go in line and strengthen the most important factor for the adaptation of the alliance, and that is cohesion. Um, a process of readjustment has already begun at the military level in 2019 with NATO's new military strategy and the political guidance for defense planning, in addition to establishing a culture of readiness with the NATO Readiness Initiative, we have created the conditions to meet future challenges, in particular by establishing two, two new operational level commands in Norfolk and in Ulm. This, this is the Joint Support and Enabling Command, a huge effort from our side at the political as well as the military level. Germany in particular is sending clear signals to Russia and to our allies and friends alike that we have the clear will and the ability to respond appropriately to military aggression and to protect the territorial integrity of our alliance. And this has to be known not only by our uh, German audience and electorate, but also in our partner countries, in particular at the northeastern flank. Germany is the lead nation of enhanced forward presence battle group Lithuania. We are the most frequent troop contributing nation to enhance Baltic air policing. We conduct frequent and comprehensive military exercises in the Baltic Sea region and we provide military personnel to staffs and military institutions, for example, the Center of Excellence for Cyber or the Baltic Defense College. Furthermore, we are strongly committed to the multinational core Northeast in Poland, and we will contribute to NATO's newly formed multinational core Southeast in Romania starting in October this year. To underline our enhanced and continued commitment, we are planning to participate with approximately 17,000 soldiers, up to 120 tanks and armored vehicles, 20 helicopters and 20 airplanes, five ships and 6,000 vehicles in NATO's 2023 response force rotation. On a political level, we see a renewed transatlantic relationship, which gives us the opportunity to adjust the alliance for the next decade and beyond. So we are certain that NATO will send a strong message on deterrence and defense at the upcoming summit. We are pursuing our dual track approach of political and military strength on the one hand and the offer of cooperation on the other hand towards Russia. Um, NATO's and Russian security is intertwined so we won't see a lasting peace in the Euro-Atlantic area without certain cooperation with Russia that adheres to the rules-based international order. The key to protect our eastern flank does not only include a reinforced force posture in Europe, in Eastern Europe in particular, or additional capabilities in air and missile defense, but primarily continues to be unity and cohesion of the alliance to ensure mutual solidarity. So in a complex and constantly changing world, NATO stands for reliability. And this is the very clear message from Berlin to all our partner capitals. Thank you, Mr. Zilborn. Thank you for the strong message. Um, are there already some questions popping up in the, in the chat? And I definitely wanna, wanna give space to them. Um, um, see whether, I can see somebody raising his or her hand. Otherwise, I'll start reading some of the chat um, the chat questions, especially related to. Um, I think that, that that's a good question of how would 
Latvia or what would Latvia like to to see Germany doing with regard to Russia on the on the industry side? I think that that's an interesting question. Maybe for even more some bilateral chats, but now with the uh, with the US kind of uh, and that's what I what I took from Rachel. Um, they still want to help, but um, it's first of all it's a little bit more of self help for the Europeans and especially for the Germans. So if we would have to do a little bit more self help. Um, how can we help the Latvians on the one hand uh, and ourselves possibly even better? What is the the idea is possibly from Riga on that? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, um, we are not free riders in the Baltics, just like our colleague in the United States mentioned, uh, we are trying to do as much as we can for our defense. And this is not only a question about 2%, actually this year our defense budget will be 236 but uh, we have been introducing so-called comprehensive defense system. Uh, we have been um, um, teaching civilians uh, how to act in different types of crises. So basically in an old language that would called really a total defense. Now, uh, what we would like to see from such countries as Germany, let's say from Europeans at large, first of all, Germans always have been a very good partners to us. And uh, there is a long history of Baltic and German cooperation. And we also must understand that just like with the United States globally uh, comes responsibility. So for Germans, it comes regionally in Europe and it also includes security. Now, uh, if we are looking for the latest, latest uh, events when Russians have been rising uh, dramatically their military presence at the Ukrainian border. And we have been really worried about possibility to escalate the conflict. And where we could describe Ukraine as not a member of NATO ally, but as an ally to us in general, uh, I would say that we were not extremely happy about European responses because we could see that Americans were telling, look guys, if you do something wrong, we will respond and you will be, uh, let's say, in a very bad situation. While uh, European diplomatic responses were kind of, everybody should restrain from the use of power, uh, which means uh, there were no kind of distinguishment between Ukraine and Russia, because Ukraine is not an aggressor here. So we can't tell to both sides the same sentence. There must be a clear message, dear friends in Russia or whoever you are, if you want to wage a war, you would have a mess. So that's what we expect also from the European side. Another thing is uh, we expect also a more kind of a active attitude towards uh, partners within NATO. Because uh, of course I mentioned this question about uh, industry and about uh, procurement, but uh, there is still kind of reluctance of such type of uh, cooperation because uh, just like previous speaker, one of the previous speakers told, we do really have a problem to guarantee uh, Baltic citizens the same security as, for instance, citizens of Germany. We cannot, with our own finances, guarantee our um, coastal defenses and our air defenses. So Germans anyway need to rise a rise military budget. Germans cannot stay on that level where they are with their military expenses and with their capabilities. So. Uh, Okay, if Germany cannot uh, accommodate uh, such increase of monies, let's say 10, 15% per year to military budget uh, themselves, they could assist us to acquire, or they could at least could station something of this weaponry um, or defense systems in the Baltic region to make us more secure. Because for us, it will take quite a long time to use our own money. We simply have no such, so large budget. We are small countries but we need the same defense because you need it. Because if Baltics fail, all Europe will be in disarray. So uh, I would expect to, um, let's say, round it up. First of all, a clear message, united message with the United States towards Moscow when it's needed. And secondly, also a much more proactive role uh, towards engaging with its partners within European Union and NATO, because it's not Latin border. It's a UN NATO border, actually, what we are talking about. Thank you. A very good point. Um, I'd like to give the floor to, and I hope that works, to uh, Rainer Meyer zum Felde. Herr Meyer zum Felde, ich hoffe, ich konnte Sie jetzt sprechen lassen. I tried. Well, yeah, do so. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, my question goes to to Rachel Eller, who's good evening, and uh, to Sec State Secretary Silberhorn. The the two key promises Germany made at three NATO summits since um, Wales 2014 was number one that we accept the 2% obligation until 2024. And number two, on the output side, even more important, that Germany reshapes its entire defense posture with the aim to provide three combat-capable divisions, which means eight to 10 combat brigades, plus uh, respective air forces and naval forces in the Baltic Sea. And these days now, after Corona, we see very obviously that neither the current government is really willing to deliver that, nor a possible next government with the CDU, CSU, and the Greens uh, would follow that. Baerbock just uh, half an hour ago made very clear she doesn't believe in these obligations and these aims. Uh, and for the deterrence, credible deterrence and defense in the Northeast, this has far-reaching consequences. My question is, how will the Biden administration cope with that frustrating perspective that the Germans do not deliver and uh, the Americans try desperately to come back to terms with us uh, now on the, on, the, on the partnership approach rather than Trump's approach? That is my question. And I'm very much concerned about that. Thank you. Thanks very much. So there's something in there from the, for the German side and for the American side. Rachel, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I know that's, that's like the most important question and, and, and almost my greatest fear because we have this new approach that's more cooperative. Uh, it's more understanding. It's more conciliatory. But can we, at the end of the day, prove that we can have effective multilateralism and that that approach delivers results more than the more transactional bullying approach of the previous administration. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try to prove that it does work better. And when we can't meet our commitments to stay in some sort of dialogue as to why that's the case and to find alternative solutions. So. You know, I'm less concerned about the input side of things, the two and the 20%. I mean, I think Germany absolutely needs to stick with its current plan, which has very clear and I think realistic milestones about the pace at which the heavy brigades will increase and modernize um, and the amount of money being put towards defense. You know, we've seen in the past, there are absorption issues, there are issues with procurement, um, institutions in Germany. So I almost have come to the realization that 2% by 2024, which by the way, was not the goal. It was aimed to move towards uh, two and 20% by 2024 is just unrealistic. I mean, Germany could put that money directly towards its own defense and it just wouldn't be absorbed in a, in a responsible way. Although I do like the minister's idea of thinking through some sort of fund or, or NATO bank or some sort of more direct assistance to the Baltics in the way that the US provides FMS and FMF. Um, that is definitely an idea that I think is worth exploring. I am, however, more worried about the output side of things. I mean, it is already a very tight schedule um, and a very thin set of requirements that NATO has put towards allies. And it is, we're already behind. So it's imperative that that bare minimum of the three combat divisions uh, with the appropriate enablers and the other forces is met and it's met on schedule. Um, and if that's not going to be the case, I think early an honest communication with the Biden administration about why that's the case ha has to be the priority. Now, you alluded to the political will side of things. I think that's a problem that only Germany can grapple with. And, and Christian has written on this, you know, how do you change public opinion? How do you get members of parliament like Mr. Silberhorn to, to broaden what they see beyond their own party or their own constituency? That is, that is something that the US can't necessarily help with. Um, Although we can, you know, we can hold people to task on on those NATO commitments, but it won't be easy. I have no illusions. Mr. Zuboff. Yes, thanks for these uh, questions. 
Um, dear Minister Pabrix, um, I, I really appreciate your clear statement because it's sometimes more convincing to hear those words from our partner countries than from uh, your own government in Germany. And indeed, it's a question of perspective as well. Um, the closer you come to Russia, the more present uh, threats and uh, concrete consequences of interferences in, uh, in a society you can see and feel. And that's why indeed we have to be clear in our, um, in our um, direction and um, I fully agree with your uh, uh, statement. Uh, there is no equidistance in Germany towards uh, Russia or United States. We clearly stand uh, at the side of Democrats and the rule of law. And we have to realize that infringements of our rules-based international order have to be responded. And that's why we have to be clear uh, on our options we have. Yes, this is diplomacy and dialogue. This is uh, developmental cooperation with many partners around the world, but uh, there are also military capabilities on the table and we have to uh, implement our capabilities in a way that we coordinate our efforts in NATO partner countries and within the European Union. And indeed, many, many questions arising in domestic debates on foreign and security policy disregard by far uh, the interoperability and uh, connectivity of uh, the efforts uh, in our core uh, institutions, European Union and, and NATO. Um, when it comes to concrete uh, fiscal and uh, fiscal planning and procurements, I do not agree if you say Germany does not deliver. Germany delivers year by year. Yes, there have been uh, two major restrictions um, in our army. One, the peace dividend after the German unity in 1990, and the second one after the global financial crisis in 2010, with substantial reductions of uh, the defense budget, of uh, our equipment, of personnel. But since 2014, the German armed forces grew again in personnel, in equipment, and in financing. Uh, our budget um, had an increase by nearly 50% since 2014, from 34 billion to now nearly 50 billion euros next year. This is an increase by nearly 50%. Only the defense budget, um, the, the, the broader score of uh, uh, NATO uh, contributions um, is, is even, even bigger. And when it comes to concrete delivery, um, um, it has been mentioned uh, money couldn't be absorbed by the German army. This is not true anymore. This has been true for a long time, yes. But uh, since last year, I would say this can no longer happen because we adjusted the structures of our planning procedures and coordinated in a better way with our parliamentary uh, procedures. Last year, for example, uh, the full budget of our defense ministry has been absorbed and even more, the incentive package of the entire government has also some new projects for uh, the defense ministry. So we could spend even more money than has been planned uh, before. So, and, and, and for this year, just to give you an example, uh, we have uh, still uh, four uh, plenary, plenary session weeks uh, before the parliamentary election in September. Uh, we have uh, lots of uh, projects pending and uh, at the moment, uh, we have at least 14 projects uh, that are fully planned, that are ripe for decision, but not fully financed yet. 
So uh, we can deliver much more than uh, we can finance at the moment. So we did our homework in our ministry, but we have to admit and to concede that uh, many uh, projects for uh, armament uh, are not a single uh, uh, interest of the defense ministry. It's in the entire interest of the German government when it comes, for example, to um, bilateral uh, commitments with partners like France or Norway, when it comes to core capabilities of our army. Um, just to give you uh, two figures, last year, the German parliament adopted uh, armament projects in the volume of more than 27 billion euros, whereas uh, the, the part of our budget for armament is only 9.5 billion euros. So uh, we already decided for financing our projects uh, uh, in years to come. And uh, since uh, the restrictions are still uh, hard uh, in, in fiscal terms, um, we have a very concrete proposal how to proceed uh, after the next elections. Uh, we want to um, consent a, a planning law for um, big volume projects in order to be able to finance our army in, uh, in the basic needs on our own. But we need a government consensus for uh, the big volumes. And this is um, carefully planned and uh, prepared for uh, the decisions to come. And so um, I, I'm not pessimistic, but uh, a lot has to be done. Uh, no one would have believed us if we, if we had said in 2014 that our budget uh, could, be, uh, could be increased up to 50 billion euros. This is the result after eight years uh, of constant uh, fiscal increases since 2014. Thanks very much. I, I'd like to pick up some, some more questions out of the chat and then also give uh, Mrs., Mr. Hoffman the, the floor to pose a question. Uh, the, the one question a little bit in, in line of what Mr. Silberhorn already responded to, and let me twist it a little bit. So uh, how long do we have to wait or how long do we have to continue to invest until we see a the significant change so that the, kind of the balance is tipping and everything is good? Because there were people in the chat were saying, yeah, you know, we are still a lot of commitments that we have basically um, committed Germany to, but we can't deliver. Um, and you say it's getting better, but the question is, so when can we see it kind of on the street, in the barracks. That would be my, my one question I'd like to put to, to Secretary of State Silberhorn. And to uh, Mr. Uh, Pabriks, uh, the interesting question I found that also important for a German audience is the change of the environment again in, in your region that is um, the situation in Belarus. How do you assess the change of the... So, I mean, I would say, me personally, the rest not, but me personally, I'm still stuck somewhat in 2014 uh, the Russians invading Eastern Ukraine. Things may have changed since then. Uh, and, and I guess it would be an interesting an interesting picture that you could give us of what has changed in the dynamics, not only vis-a-vis -vis your countries in the in, in the northern northeastern Europe, but also with the relationship towards Russia. And last but not least, I'd like to give now the, uh, the floor to Helmut Hoffmann to give him uh, the opportunity to pose his question. And I hope uh, that works out. Mr. Hoffmann. Please. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for an interesting discussion. Um, I have to say, whenever I follow these discussions on NATO and security policy, etc., I feel a little bit like in the famous Groundhog Day movie because uh, it's sort of a, a recurrent theme. We always hear the same refrain, so to speak. NATO needs to do much more. That's basically the underlying melody. Um, NATO needs to do much more to deal with the Russian threat, basically. So the impression and the implication of this is NATO is much weaker than Russia. Clearly, I mean, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. Now, I just wonder on what facts and figures is this actually based? 
um, how do you assess, uh, let's say, the military balance between NATO and Russia in concrete terms of defense budgets or main weapon systems? Can I suggest to you just to take a look at the data as provided by the renowned uh, International Institute for Strategic Studies in London? And I've actually done that. <laughs> when you look at this, I mean, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. Uh, let's take, and I'm finished in a second. Let's just take a look at military budgets, defense expenditures. Uh, when you add up the figures from the IIS military balance publication, you will see that NATO spends roughly 1 billion US dollars per year. Uh, Russia, the figures vary. London says uh, 45, CPRI, Stockholm says something like 60. And of course, there is always the factor that um, uh, purchasing power is, of course, uh, very different. So let's say the Russians spend de facto three times what they actually spend on paper. So you have roundly 120 uh, million, a billion uh, um, uh, uh, US dollars per year, which compares to uh, 1,000 of NATO. Take a look at main military weapon systems. I have it in front of me that I don't want to go too much into detail. But even in terms of tanks, NATO enjoys a huge superiority. Fighter aircraft, ground attack helicopters, everywhere, huge superiority. So I just wonder where you actually take this from, other than to say that regionally speaking, and that's another matter, of course, uh, but I, and this is a question, and I will end on this note, uh, to the Minister of Latvia. Um, do you think that it would make sense to, in, a, in, sort of, in an ideal world from your perspective, to put so much NATO firepower on your borders that an attack by the Russians, given this geostrategic situation, that an attack could be repelled within the first 24 hours. If, uh, yeah, this is thank you very much. We would like still to have the opportunity to let others okay. answer. Yeah, sure, it sure. would be good because otherwise we'd, no, we're I, just I, running I, out of I'm time. Fin I'm finished. Thank but you. I guess the time. message has come across. Okay, and okay, it's okay, it's a very important question because this is not a this is not an outlier question in, in this country. So I was very happy to have that. And I know it's uh, I know there are answers to this. Uh, but uh, as I'm the moderator, I just want to give the floor back uh, to our panelists. Who would like Hi, to start? May so, I? Please. please. Yeah. So Mr. Pabrik's first and then Mr. Silverhorn? Uh, well, Mr. Silverhorn can be first too, no, okay. no problem. Okay, then we, then we change the direction and Mr. Silverhorn okay. now goes first. Okay, is there a deadline for the equipment of our armed forces? No there will never be a deadline. We have to think in cycles. And uh, it's a constant task uh, to equip our army. And the level of ambition, the level of, ambition of course, is a, is a political decision. And the level of ambition in, in Germany has been laid down in a white book on security policy from 2016. It goes fully in line with NATO and EU planning. And by the way, we, uh, our task is uh, to, to accomplish what has been uh, fixed as level of ambition uh, five years ago, not less and not more. And therefore, it's indeed uh, a crucial question not uh, to think in percentages of uh, our budget only, but to uh, see the concrete capabilities we have to deliver. Um, in Germany, we have 10% uh, of um, the, the NATO's um, uh, added GDP. And 10% of military capabilities among NATO partners would be a fair share. Um, on the way to achieve 10% military capabilities, uh, we set the goal uh, to uh, fully equip three uh, divisions of our land forces. Three, not a single one is fully equipped today. And therefore there remains, a lot remains uh, to be done. Um, 
of course our budget is is different from uh, the situation in Russia, China or other countries because 40% of our expenditure goes to personnel 40% uh, the budget for armament is only 9.5 billion euros a year. So it, it depends on which uh, figures you want to, to compare. But to conclude, um, we should not um, uh, make the mistake to explain our uh, armament and our capability planning uh, towards Russia only. Our uh, approach is a much more global one. Uh, in order to tackle global uh, challenges, we have to cooperate among democratic partners in particular around the globe. And that's why our military capabilities have to respond to this global approach, in particular in the maritime dimension. So it's not a, a, a bilateral um, uh, intention or, or, or direction of our armament uh, processes. We follow uh, the global approach to be a fair partner within NATO and European Union, and at the same time to cooperate closer than before with our democratic partners around the world. Thanks very much. Now, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will start with a second question or second answer because I think it's fundamental and crucial for Western audience to understand what does it mean to live uh, at the border area with such country as Russia? And what does it mean that you do not have a strategic depth and you are a small nation state, uh, even if you are a member of the largest military alliance and also European Union? Look, uh, our concerns, of course, are not with the general numbers, where NATO is obviously the strongest alliance in the world, military alliance, uh, no matter with whom you, do you measure that. But uh, we have to look, of course, regionally, and we have to look more close into details. Our concern have been always that we do not know, um, can we actually endure the first three, five, or 10 days, and there have not been a politically and militarily false answer to this. And I think it is highly important because uh, the same people who question sometimes, why do we worry that, uh, about Russia if NATO, for instance, is such a strong alliance? The same people, I believe, will count or measure, as we would say here, seven times, if they will be, for instance, put into the situation, where uh, with a very short notice incursion, Russian troops, just like they entered Crimea, they would enter some parts of Latvia or Estonia or Lithuania or maybe some other place, and then simply declare this as a status quo. They will tell we are ready now to talk. Will the same people in the West risk with a nuclear annihilation war with Russia? I'm afraid there'll be such a large uh, political and public response to the, no, no, let's, let's, let's have a minsk Riga dialogue here. Let's, let's talk. Of course, we can bring this country to senses. And Russians will facilitate that. And uh, I think there is a lot of uh, different uh, kind of uh, hypotheses and possibilities for Russians to act like this. And there is no trust to this country anymore, as far as the military part, because it simply can happen. So yes. If you ask me or if you ask representatives of our countries in this region, they would tell, yes, we do not want to lose any inch, any centimeter, anything from our territory. We want simply to be so strong that first of all, such offense is not coming. But if somebody is planning this offense, then we can uh, guarantee to our citizens that they will not live anymore again under the Soviet or Russian occupation. And this is for us a fundamental issue. And people in many Western countries, I believe, still do not understand the sentiment. We are ready to do anything not to happen this again, because differently from you, we have been there for too long. And this was extremely devastating for our minds, for our economy, for our families, for our culture, for anything. So we're not going to repeat this. We'll do anything we need this uh, to um, avoid that. Now, as far as the second question, Belarus, basically after the 
events starting in last year in August. Uh, we regard Belarus as a militarily lost country, a country which doesn't have any more its milita military autonomy. What does it mean for us? It means that all kind of um, short notice strategic military planning, uh, what Russians could do eventually against their neighbors, uh, will not be any more hindered by presence of Belarusian government. Yes, the country on the paper still exists militarily, uh, it is under the Russian command. This is our assumption, uh, very clearly. And this, this makes, um, again, to readjust our planning. And uh, a long-term lesson of this is that uh, we as uh, Europeans, as European Union, we have been paying too less attention to many of these countries which have been under the former Soviet rule. We do not have enough understanding. We do not have uh, enough um, connections to them, influences and possibilities to assist them and to work with them. And this is what we have been always telling and urging our partners in European Union and in NATO to put more attention exactly to these countries. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, there were clear answers. Rachel, I'd like to, in the last words, kind of throw us back to the geographically longer perspective. If you evaluate all this, what we've discussed, is there hope for us that we make kind of the, the progress that is needed because the US needs our progress? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been, I've been looking pretty closely at allied military capabilities and how much they've improved since the, the ship started to turn in 2014. And there's no doubt that this is going to take time and there are some shortfalls that may persist for either political or technological reasons but things are moving in the right direction. So I think it's you know the burden of all of us to keep the pressure on politically, to make sure people are meeting their NATO commitments. Um, and, and it shouldn't be lost on people that, you know it is true what, what uh, Minister Silberhorn said, that Germany does provide the bulk of forces to NATO operations, and it does very closely adhere to the NATO defense planning process. So I think as we, we need to recognize how important it is to continue on in on this path and to stick to the timelines. You know, to the previous question about <clears throat> Russia um, and are they truly superior to NATO forces and capabilities, I think that's not the case, particularly with regard to quality and range and diversity of capabilities and forces. They have a geographic advantage. Uh, they have a doctrine advantage because they're rather aggressive um, and our forces are dispersed. So I think the way to get at this problem is to think about what their strengths are and what our disadvantages are and backward plan from there. So some of the things we talked about earlier on about having this more regional approach that underpins things going on at a NATO or European Union level is going to be vital to making sure that we get that piece of the puzzle right. I think another element uh, that sort of backwards plans from Russia's strengths is to make sure that we're using the full range of capabilities. So in that first phase between zero and, and one, when Article 5 has been breached, let's make sure we're using cross-government tools and everything at our disposal, economics, trade, sanctions, um, and whatnot. So I think there's a way to get at this. It's not a black and white answer. It's not a forced mass answer, but it is about sticking to those plans that are there and then revising the way that we plan and organize our forces, not on a view that dates from 2014, but a view that, and, and a level of ambition that is grounded in the present and is also thinking about modernization of capabilities that's already underway, because we're already behind. Okay. That's a positive note almost. Thank you, Rachel. Almost, <laughs> almost exactly. We need to keep a little bit up, up the challenge. Um, the time is up. Uh, we even have been a little bit over time, but uh, I was very grateful that uh, you have given all the explanation and the answers that, uh, that you've given. So thank you to all the panelists for taking the time, uh, not only to be here, but also to speak to the German audience and uh, kind of help us to explain better the situation uh, with regard to our partners, uh, their problems and their perspectives of uh, 
uh, what this country can do and should possibly do. So thank you very much to uh, Minister Pabrik. Thank you very much to Secretary of State, Action. Mr. Silberhorn. And Rachel, thank you very much. And uh, it was great seeing you all. And I hope to see you soon. And of course, and hopefully in physical terms and not in kind of, you know, with mm -hmm. the, with all no, the uh, kind of distance that all this makes for us. Thank you very much. And I'm, uh, apologies to, to all those questions. I wasn't allowed to, uh, due to time reasons, allowed to post. Uh, we hope to find another opportunity. Thank you very much. Have all a good evening. Bye-bye.